I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Jean Hines, a managing partner at Wellington Management, where she is one of three people responsible for the governance of Wellington's storied partnership. Jean is also the sector leader for the firm's healthcare team that manages the Vanguard Healthcare Fund, three global healthcare hedge funds, and the global healthcare sector portfolios. She joined Wellington after graduating from college in 1991 and has been at the firm ever since. Our conversation covers Wellington's humanistic culture, its evolution from a U.S. value shop to a global federation of boutiques, talent recruitment, the successful merit-based partnership structure, and the Wellington of the future. Along the way, we touch on Jean's progression from an administrative assistant to a managing partner, the healthcare team's investment philosophy and process, a day in her work life, and topical issues of active versus passive, public and private investing, and large and small firms. Please enjoy my conversation with Jean Hines. Jean, thanks so much for doing this. Glad to be here. So we're going to try to tell your story and the Wellington story. How did you first get interested in investing? So I went to Wellesley College, and in my junior year, I took a, a very famous class at the time, a sociology class called Sociology and Work. And so as part of that class, we had to get an internship. And so I found my way to a local stockbroker in Boston and had an internship for that semester. And that is what got me interested in the stock market. My parents are immigrants, and my father's a bricklayer, and my mother's a homemaker. And I didn't even know what a stock was, really, until the crash of 1987 when I was at Wellesley. So when I first got that internship, I really liked the internship. I didn't like the stock broken calling part of it, but I knew at the end of that that I wanted to know why stocks went up and down. And so that's how I found my way to looking for jobs after I graduated and found my way to Wellington. And your first job here was what? So I was an administrative assistant in the research department. So I've been in the research department my entire career, 28 years here at Wellington. And back when I joined, there were just a little over 300 employees. And Wellington had started hiring more people in the early 1990s. And they started hiring people with college degrees to be administrative assistant, knowing that I'd be doing some research assistant work and modeling. But also the reason I came to Wellington is because the headhunter said, this is a special place and you should take this job, even if it doesn't have the title. So what was Wellington like back then? You said 300 people, how big in assets? The assets in 1991 were about 50 billion. As I said, a little over 300 people. We were all on Three floors at 75 State Street, which is another building from where we are now. And so departments were intermixed. So you had fixed income and trading and research and client service all on a few floors. It was kind of all hands on deck. Everyone helped to do everything. And what was thought of as special? It was the culture. And when I think about describing what I did and my culture, the culture of Wellington to my friends who were in many different companies around the country, it was a very humanistic place. It was a very merit-based organization. And just really, when I think about Wellington, it's a collection of very smart, driven people. And that's true in 2018, and it was definitely true in 1991. And you used the word humanistic, which is not something often associated with the asset management industry. What does that mean here? It means that we care about people. So, you know, you're going to spend hours and hours and a day and a week and a year and over years here in working, you're going to be spending your lives with people. And so you want to have an environment where people care about each other, where the expectations are high. So that doesn't mean we're a humanistic people that, that has low expectations. We have high expectations. That's why the partnership and the merit-based part of our organization is so important. But it's also a recognition that people's lives aren't linear sicknesses happen and pregnancies happen and family emergencies happen. And and so I would say that part of it is what I think about when I think about humanistic. It's that we want people to 
thrive here, and we want this to be their family too. So you start as an administrative assistant. What was the initial progression from that to, let's take the next steps along the way? Just as a little bit of background, one of the things I did as an administrative assistant is do the morning meeting notes. We have a morning meeting that's been in place for over 60 years, and so I did the morning meeting notes once a week, and I did them in my own way. So that is what got me noticed at Wellington. So what was your way? I think it was a way that I was really interested in stocks, and so I think my notes were sort of more accurate about the discussion that was happening. They were more complete than other notes that were taking place. And so that's what got me noticed. And at the end of 1992, early 1993, I started working with Ed Owens, who's been my mentor for 20 years. And he was starting to expand his responsibilities away from just research. And he needed someone to work with him. And they wanted him to hire someone from the outside and more senior And he decided, well, we know Gene can write, so I moved over to work with him, still as an administrative assistant. But from early 1993 on, I went to every company meeting with him. That was a time when there was a lot of company creation in biotech. And I started working with him in terms of all his coverage. So writing about the pharmaceutical companies, writing about the biotech companies. And over this period of time, I went from being the writer to being more of the analyst. And so the progression was a few years after that, becoming a research assistant. We didn't have a title of a research assistant back in 1994 when they created that title, becoming a global industry analyst a year or two later. I would say when I think about the decade of the 90s, it was really learning to become an analyst and learning how to be a researcher and what mattered. And I had the luxury of working with one of the best investors in the world and learning under him. So if we unpack that a little bit of what it means to be a researcher, what were the building blocks? So when I think about our philosophy and process of our team now, the healthcare team, one of the things I say to clients is we need to know where healthcare is going, where healthcare is going to be in 2025. And in order to know that, you need to own healthcare and you need to own the research. So I think the roots of that all started when I was working with Ed. And that really is dissecting each company down to becoming very micro, but also really figuring out where change is happening. So in order to do that, we took a very comprehensive approach to research, meaning we look at all companies under our coverage. We have a broad breadth of knowledge in pharma and biotech, which was most of my career. That means knowing every therapeutic disease, knowing how it's treated. And then the key then, which is what I really believe I learned over time, is learning how to focus. So having that breath and then knowing where change is going to happen and then using your research abilities to really focus in on that change and then get all the data points you can possibly get around that change. So when that light bulb goes off that you need to do a deep dive, you use the word change. What type of change are you looking for in your space? So when I think broadly about healthcare, if I look at biotech and pharmaceuticals, it's how diseases will be treated five to 10 years forward. Because if we can figure out how diseases will be treated, then we'll get the stocks right. So that's number one. How will the standard of care of medicine change? Medicine is not changing at the same rate for every disease. So figuring out where the change is happening the most has been really critical in my career over time. And then figuring out who the winners are. Sometimes there are multiple winners and sometimes there's one winner. And so that then becomes the micro part of the research process. I know there's tons of change happening with genomics and particularly in biotech. What are your key couple of points of what this looks like in five or 10 years from now? Yeah, so I would say we are at a point in time where there's unprecedented change. So if I look at over my career, there's probably been 15 areas of medicine in any rolling two or three year period that was changing. And now there's probably 40 or 50 areas of medicine. So there's a lot more change happening in the sector than there has been over the past 25 years. I think there's a couple of things that are very exciting. It's understanding disease biology and pathways at such a a micro level is allowing scientists, both at the biopharmaceutical companies as well as in academia, to elucidate targets and elucidate pathways that were not known before. And that's resulting in new targets. And so where it's happening first is in oncology. So oncology tends to be a disease of mutations. And so 
about 40% of the industry's um, R&D now is going to oncology. There's a lot of, obviously, a lot that can be done to really improve the standard of care there. And then I would say the other thing that's happening is that we're opening up these rare diseases. So there's hundreds of rare diseases that have never been treated before because you either didn't know what the gene was or you didn't know what the underlying cause was or there was no way to go after that biology. So now there are new ways to go after, including small molecule oral pills and antibodies. There's also new ways of targeting RNA and DNA through RNA interference or gene therapy that weren't in existence even five years ago. I got to do a little shout out for Cycle for Survival that I've been involved in for a long time that provides rare cancer research for Memorial Sloan Kettering. Those business models are kind of interesting, particularly in the rare cancer side, where the volume of patients doesn't lend itself to thinking about scaled drugs that make tons of money for pharma companies. How has technology allowed that research to get done in a profitable way? So the interesting thing is that rare diseases, which first started being treated in the early to mid-1990s, they have a different pricing model versus diseases that go after large scale. So the, the reason that the industry can go after and target these diseases that impact 1,000 people or 2,000 people or 5,000 people is because you get higher pricing during your patent life. And so I'm a big believer that this industry needs to price for for the risk they take and the innovation they take, and they need to earn a return over the life cycle of their patents. And if you are going after a very large disease, such as cholesterol or heart failure or depression, you need to price at a lower price because you can't break the bank. And if you're going after diseases that are very small, then you can garner a higher price, and that's the incentive to do the research. So let's pull back a little bit. You have in the biotech area that we're talking about, a certain way of looking at stocks, and how does that work its way back into portfolios that you're managing, and then broader portfolios that Wellington's managing? So we have a healthcare team of 12 people that are focusing on all healthcare stocks. There's about 1,200 publicly traded healthcare stocks and a few hundred private stocks that we look at as well. And that team is pretty evenly split between those who follow healthcare services and devices and those who follow biotech and pharmaceutical and just, companies. Just 12 people. 12 people. What are the total assets of healthcare across all of the Wellington products? Across all of the Wellington products, it's about $120 billion. So it's a a large part of our equity assets. And on the team, we manage about 65 to 70 billion of those assets. The reason why 12 is enough is it's a very long cycle industry. So it is an industry that is, even though there's a lot of change happening, that change happens over 10 years to bring a drug to the market. And so we want to make sure we're covering all the companies and there is more change happening. But I think if you narrow people's focus too much, they won't be able to figure out that change. So that's the philosophy of our team, that you have people who have been at Wellington, and we can get into why people stay at Wellington. And so if you have very long-tenured people, you have a company that focuses on the long-term, and we have an industry that we follow that's long-term, and sort of the perfect match for our philosophy and process. Yeah. So let's just pull that back one more layer. Not every industry looks like that. So how are assets managed and researched across Wellington, across industries? Yeah, so we have a global industry research department, which I'm a part of, and we are responsible not only for managing and putting stocks into our portfolios for our healthcare clients, we're also responsible for generating research and recommendations for the entire organization. And the unique thing about Wellington is that it's a federation of boutiques, so we have about 55 different boutiques across equities, fixed income, multi-asset, research platforms, quant, alt-risk premia. So those are our platforms. And it's part of the global industry research department. We're responsible for then giving recommendations. And those boutiques then are responsible for implementing those in their portfolios. And does each boutique go about things differently? Each boutique has a philosophy and process, so their own philosophy and process on how they believe in investing. It could be a U.S. growth philosophy. It could be a global core philosophy. It could be a global fixed income, which could be absolute return. It could be relative. So every boutique has, has their own philosophy and process in their way of making sure they cover their opportunity set. And so you have some teams that are large and some teams that are smaller. I think everyone, though, does rely to some extent on the broad research department, both macro research and 
company-specific credit research and equity research. But that's the beauty of Wellington. You have these small groups of teams that work together. Like I would say I spend most of my time with the healthcare team, but then you, you get the benefit of the broad collaboration at Wellington. So if you go back to your early years here, and there are fewer people, probably wasn't set up quite the same way. Was there more of an ethos of the firm that there was either a style bias or a certain way of doing research back then? So I think the way we do research is probably not dramatically different. I mean, when I came, we had a group of people in our central research department that were very long tenured, did deep research. So I think that part of Wellington is the same. I think we're just a broader, more diversified organization. So we've been able to take that culture that we had in the 1990s and expand it to many different parts of the market. And that has made the ecosystem much more robust. So when I started in the early 1990s, we probably were heavily dominated by U.S. value research on the equity side. And that has changed dramatically. So now we have a firm that's very balanced between equity and fixed income, multi-asset, We have growth and value and small cap and mid cap and global bonds and U.S. bonds. How did that evolve? There are certain value shops that have stayed die-in-the-wool value. What were those initial key decisions of the leadership to say we're going to expand into effectively a broader philosophy of investing? When I take Wellington and how we've expanded the investment platform over the last 25 years, I think there's a couple of things that happened along the way, and it all revolves around talent. So they tend to be talent-driven strategies that get driven then by the business. And I would say in the 1990s, the two most important things were starting our long-short business, and that was really around a person and talent, and then starting our research portfolios. So that was why our strong global industry research platform, people never left because you had analysts like myself have the ability to run money as well as be researchers. Then slowly over that decade, we started adding people that had a growth bias. So it was really one person at a time bringing in people that had new skill. I would say if you look in this decade of the 2000s, the Investing in our fixed income platform was a very strategic decision, investing way ahead of the assets coming in. So that was a very strategic decision that was made around 2003 or four. And then the other strategic decision was to globalize. So it was really an observation that a lot of the company creation was happening outside of the U.S. and that are we attracting the best people to follow a company in China or in Germany based in Boston? And so that was the decision in 2006 to really globalize the investment platform. How about in the last decade? I would say the last decade is a continuation of globalization. So if we started globalizing the investment platform in 2006, 7, I actually went to London to help with that globalization of the platform back in 2007 and 2008. We were only a handful of people. So now if you look at where we are, 25% of our employees are in EMEA or Asia PAC. We have 28% of our investors now in EMEA and Asia PAC. That's talent one at a time, but it took a decade. When you look back a decade later, we've gone from virtually most of our investors being in Boston to being a much more global organization. I think the other thing we've done in the past couple of years is continue to break down the silos of the asset classes. So if you looked at Wellington in the 1990s, equity and fixed income were very separate. And I would say that probably began to break down around the time of the global financial crisis, where our fixed income colleagues and equity colleagues really worked together to identify the issues of the global financial crisis. And I think that is one of our goals now. How do we harness all of those insights from people working on different areas to benefit the platform? Now you have employees around the world in different time zones. There are more people. There are people that have come here at different stages of their careers. So what are the things that you think about how to make that synergy and cross-fertilization work? So for me, as one of the managing partners, that's one of the most important things to do. How do we attract talent? How do we retain talent? How do we make our competitive edge, which I do believe is our ability to collaborate globally, is one of our competitive edges? And how do we make sure 
that's sustainable. And there's all sorts of things we do. It's travel. It's spending time with people. I think technology helps a lot. When we think about when we began to globalize the platform, the fact that video was available around the same time really clearly helped us. So we have a series of investment meetings that happen over video, and it really now feels, even though with the video in the last couple of years, it feels like people are in the room. But the burden still is on our Asia colleagues. And if we want people to be in the room, it has to happen 7 a.m. Boston time. And because you want to include our Europe colleagues, to get everyone in the room is hard. For instance, one of the things as we continue to evolve this platform, a few times a year we're having our morning meeting at 7.30 at night. So small things like that, how to evolve to make make it not as much of a burden on colleagues that are in Asia. You started by saying recruit talent, train talent, retain talent. What are the secret sauces of recruiting the right people for this culture? So a lot of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> what does a lot mean? So I think if you ask the last 100 people that were hired at Wellington, they will say the interview process is long and in-depth and at the time can seem like a lot. But it's interesting. I remember talking to some new joiners in our London office over the summer, and one of the things they said is by the time you're done with these 20 or 30 interviews, you actually are ready to join. 20 or 30 interviews. 20 or 30 interviews. So I think we have a very strong track record of bringing in talent, meaning we don't often make mistakes on who we bring in. And culture is a really, really important part of that. And I thought it was a really interesting insight. They're ready to leave and they're ready to join by the time they meet 20 or 30 colleagues. It's probably too much and it's probably also some benefit to having all of those long. Is there a commonality in the interview process across those of what you're trying to glean out of the candidates? We do a better job today of different people trying to get different aspects. So you're not asking the same questions. So different people are assigned different aspects of that mosaic of a person. But I think the key asset, one, are they a good business person or are they a good investor? Do we think they have investment skill? Number one, right? Number two, will they be additive and help us evolve our culture? And I think the key to that is, do they like to collaborate? So You can find that out through those 20 or 30 interviews. Do they want to come in? I remember when we were hiring our first portfolio manager in London, and I was involved in maybe 20 candidate interviews at the time. Other colleagues did 100. I think we interviewed 150 to hire our first portfolio manager in London, which was critical. Like that hire was critical for the equity platform in London. And you could tell when you ask those questions, do they want to just come in and do their own thing or do they want to be part of the ecosystem? So the most successful people that come in, really, they will say we're much more collaborative than we say we are, than the peers in the interviews. Our culture is stronger than appears peers in the interviews. And they often want to spend the rest of their careers here. So, And clearly many people do that. What is it that's kept people here for so long? So everything starts with our business model, our ownership model, which is a private partnership. So we are very fortunate that in 1979, the founding partners took the company private, and they created a structure that is enduring still to this day. And the partnership structure, it's a merit-based structure, so it's not a tenure-based partnership structure. So that, again, is back to the culture. We are humanistic long-term, caring culture with high expectations. How does it actually work across the partners? So if it's merit-based, there's an implication that as you get maybe on in your career, maybe you don't have as much value as someone who's coming up or now running. What are some of the mechanics of how the partnership structure works for everybody? We have three managing partners. So I'm one of those managing partners. And our most important duties in that managing partner role is to nominate new partners that the partners elect. So the partners are very involved. Appoint managing directors, which is a step before a partner. Determine a managing director bonus, which is sharing the part of the profits of the firm and then allocating the profits of the firm to each partner every year. The partnership has to have a significant amount of trust in us. We have a lot of information to try to determine what is the fair allocation of profits over time. What is not fair to say is that people that have been here a long time, their impact is lower because some people continue to accelerate their impact till the very end. And there are some incentives to continue, some incentives of the partnership that make that happen. 
So I think the philosophy of the partnership is we want the pie to grow. Do retired partners walk away from future economics if they're no longer contributing then? There is some future economics for retired partners. And the formula of that is why it makes it so easy for the partners to elect new partners and partners to leave. So going back to 1979, when the partnership structure was started, it was a brilliant partnership structure. I want to turn to some of these sort of interesting issues of product development over time. You mentioned the formation of hedge funds in the 90s. And not a lot of traditional, say, long-only firms have done that successfully. And part of it is because the differential compensation structure and the potential for stardom as a result. I know from my old business that Wellington's done a phenomenal job of building some outstanding hedge fund products. How did you make the business work in such a way that didn't jeopardize the culture of the firm? It goes back to the fact that Wellington is not a star culture. So that goes back to who we hire. If someone needs to be a star, they're not going to be a good fit here. So I think that's number one, that we have a lot of people who are humble and love investing. And we want to continue to create a culture where a new person who's 25 years old can challenge someone who's been here for 30 to 40 years. And that's something we strive towards. So we don't have a star culture. That's probably number one. Number two, again, it's back to the partnership economics and how the profits are allocated by the managing partners and that trust that will be very fair in that process, I think also reduces that conflict. How in the world do you spend your day? Because I'm thinking, okay, there's a month of your year that's going to go to figuring out compensation. There's another three months of your year that might be interviewing people, maybe a little bit less these days. And you're managing and overseeing a team, managing a substantial amount of assets. And I imagine as one of the three managing partners, there's also all kinds of firm issues that come up. So what do you do with the 20 nine hours of your day that you're working? (laughs) So first of all, being a managing partner and being a portfolio manager requires a lot of organizational skills. So that's one of the skills I have is that I guess one of my super skills is being very organized. The other thing about being an investor and being a managing partner is that I have very low turnover. So my turnover in my portfolios tends to be 15 to 30 percent. So I'm not trading every day. And that's been very consistent throughout my career. So, you know, what I need to do for my clients on the healthcare side is making sure that I am reading a lot. I have dedicated times where I'm reading and thinking and putting mosaics together and working with the team. I rely heavily on the healthcare team. We have a number of people who are coming up the curve and taking on more responsibility. So that's a critical part of my job. And I would say 75% of my job is healthcare and 25% is being a managing partner, firm levels, firm issues. But like you said, at different times of the year, there's very little managing partner things that I have to do. And sometimes of the year, there's more. And so you have to just be disciplined and organized. And, you know, I'm going to be working a lot <laughs> over the next couple of months. And that's OK. That's OK. So you have to make sure you're still doing your day job. And, and the thing about it is I love both parts of the job. So it makes it easy to do both. Wellington, for a long time, has managed active assets under the Vanguard brand. How do you think about the active-passive debate. If you listen to Vanguard and what their philosophy is, they're not a passive company. Their philosophy is to be a low cost both on the active side and the passive side. And there's a place for both passive and a place for active. I think there's a place for active if you can generate alpha. So when we think about Wellington, like it's much more competitive. We need to be able to, over an investment cycle, deliver alpha for clients. So that's how I think about it for us. Like, how can we be successful as being an active manager and not in the passive world? One, how can we be successful over the next 10 or 20 years for our clients? It is providing solutions. It's providing a return stream that the clients want, and it's providing differentiated returns relative to what they can buy in the passive space. So that's what we need to do. And if we can't deliver that, that would be a disappointment. And that's not our strategy is to Everything we're working towards is to be able to deliver that for clients over an investment cycle. And believing that, as you do, with broad-based portfolios, almost lends itself, if you can succeed, to saying, what should be the place for passive? I mean, you can broadly say, well, passive is helpful for markets. But Wellington manages a fairly sizable amount of assets and has done it very well. Why is it that Wellington's able to do this? when the data and the statistics say, well, 
all active managers together by definition can't beat the market that a fee is. I think it goes back to our culture. So having that culture of investment excellence, I think the collaborative ecosystem where you are able to gain insights from your credit colleagues or your fixed income colleagues that are differentiated in the marketplace. I think it all goes back to the partnership model, the ownership model, and we're doing it at scale now. It's very unusual to have a trillion dollar asset manager that's also privately owned. There aren't that many of us. That's one of my core responsibilities. How do we make sure that happens and, and it's enduring for the next 50 years? Yeah. So within the broad partnership structure, how have you thought about organizational design of teams, boutiques, of what's optimal for investing? It goes down to every area of investing could be different, right? It's really dependent on the team. So when you think about healthcare, for example, you know, a decade ago, we had fewer assets, but the market changed, the number of companies in the market changed. So we have to be evolving and dynamic in that process. If you think about our global fixed income, that's a larger team because you're trying to have specialists take risk in very specialized areas. So I think every area of investing is a different model. How we do Japan, how we do China is very dependent on the talent we have and and how they want to form teams, and what the opportunity set is. And so I guess we're very flexible. I want to touch on some sort of highly topical areas in investing and just kind of get your take. How are you thinking about integrating data, AI, decision science? So one of our big areas of investment is in, we have a new group form or group coming together called investment science. And so that's a big area of investment for Wellington as a whole. And the goal of that group would be, when I think about all of those 55 platforms and you think about who uses science in their investment, the balance between the art of investing and the science of investing, there are going to be some groups that now heavily rely on science. Our quant group, some of our quant-based fixed income investors, there are even some equity investors who have a heavily science-driven screening process. And then there are going to be some investors that don't use science at all. And so the goal of our investment science group over the next few years would be to elevate that for everyone. And so how do I use science in my process? So I'm pretty excited about that, being probably on the end of the curve that doesn't use science as much. And the goal would be to have that group will do trading analytics, will do risk analysis of portfolios, is doing big data and how do you incorporate big data into your investment process. And I think what's unique, and if we can get that right, will be pretty powerful. How do you do investment coaching? Even investors that have been 10, 20, 30 years, how do you continue to become a better investor over time? So we have a group of people that were existing at Wellington. We have an aggressive hiring program. And and so we'll see how that evolves over time. I'm pretty enthusiastic that it could make a difference. How have you thought about incorporating the science of behavior and behavioral finance into portfolio decisions across the boutiques? Well, I think at Wellington, we bring in outside speakers to think about that. So I would say there are definitely resources over time. We have a number of leadership and development programs that we've been working on, including something called the Portfolio Management Development Program. And about 80 investors have gone through that program now. We have a leadership excellence program, again, which involves both business people and investors. How do you become a leader? Like being a leader and being an investor has a lot of overlap. And I think this investment science will bring that to a new level. But I think most importantly, over the last decade, all investors go through what's called philosophy and process. And so we don't have one way of this behavioral science, one way of thinking, but we have this process now where and you have to go through it many times over time. What is your individual philosophy of investing? What is your process for investing? And I think we've spent a large amount of our time helping that. And the investors who really know themselves as investors, both have a really strong philosophy and a really strong process, tend to be our best investors. So that has been a great amount of time and effort, and that will be continual. Maybe we just go back to focusing on the healthcare side. How do you think about portfolio construction? And particularly, there are some long only, but then hedge fund stuff where it gets a little bit more variables to play with. So when I think about how I'm investing, because I run both long only and long short portfolios, in aggregate, it's, again, getting back to where's healthcare going to be in five to eight years. And so that's where I spend most of my time. What insights do I have about where healthcare is going? 
Then you have to bring it down to valuation. What are the valuations of the stocks? And then how do you implement that in the portfolios? So I would say the themes we have or the insights we have are implemented across our portfolios. And sometimes they're implemented with very large cap companies. And sometimes they're implemented with sort of the full basket of small and micro cap companies. Well, I'll stay with the long side first. So how do you have an insight and how do you construct that in portfolios? And sometimes you construct that with one stock because you feel like you have that stock is going to be the main beneficiary of that. Personally, love when I can have an insight and I can do it in four or five or six stocks. So I might be able to do it in a big company. If you go back over a decade, if implementing a bet on diabetes, you could do it with big companies. You could do it with small companies that had partnerships. So there's a lot of change happening in diabetes a decade ago and how that was implemented in the portfolios. So that's my favorite way of investing, and that doesn't always happen. But it generally happens that if you have an insight into how something's changing, you can implement it in a way that allows you to actually have a bigger bet without undue risk. And as you aggregate that up into portfolio position sizing, do you have any rules of thumb that you use? Again, it's based on conviction. I invest in an area that is very volatile, and it's also an area that the insights happen over a very long period of time. And so I guess my rules of thumb would be I want to invest in an insight that's evolving over time because you're going through, let's say, a phase two drug that's going to take five or six years for it to make it to the market. How does your view evolve over time? And I use position sizing as is a really a critical skill to be able to know my conviction level. What I don't do necessarily is say, well, I think there's a 50% chance this is going to work because otherwise you would never invest in anything. <laughs> but I'd rather say, I think this is going to work, but what is my conviction level? Your conviction level can be really high or it can be good, but maybe not quite as high. And you calibrate that over time. Also, like one of the things I do in my process is knowing at any point in time what that is worth. So there's a long time before this drug makes it to the market. And if it makes it to the market, it's going to be worth this. And sometimes it can get ahead of itself. So being very disciplined about scaling back positions, even if you still like them, adding to positions, leaning into liquidity are all the things that bring that deep research into a portfolio. And how do you incorporate that on the short side for your long, short portfolios? The short portfolio is an extension of our research. So if we're going to own healthcare, we're going to own all companies. And we're going to have some very high conviction longs where we think there's a lot of change happening. And that change happening could be detrimental to some companies. So I would say the short portfolio is a combination of companies we think are disadvantaged or things are changing, or the drug doesn't work, we don't believe in the science. There also is a combination of where do we think the cycle is in healthcare investing. So in healthcare specifically, we're not investing in a multi-sector or multi-industry that we don't have as many tools. So the most important tools we have is what is our gross, what is our net exposure? Do we go big cap or small cap? And those are really critical to figuring out what our positioning will be. On the hedge fund side, are you sensitive to how other healthcare or biotech funds are positioned in determining the appropriate level of gross and net? I guess we don't spend a lot of time looking at how our competitors are positioned. We try to be extremely independent. But saying that, what we do look at is what are inflows into sector funds, how many IPOs are happening, what's the inflows into the passive funds, and those could be indicators of things getting overheated or sentiment being really low. So those are some of the things we look at in the marketplace. Have there been any mistakes at the firm level that, looking back, sort of negatively changed the inflection for a few years of the trajectory of the business? Nothing comes right to mind. I'm a long-term investor. I take things with a long-term view. And I think we've evolved as a company. And we probably haven't gotten into every business that has grown, obviously. But I don't want to say there have been major mistakes that have pivoted us in the wrong way. So clearly, there were parts of the markets we we could have invested in more aggressively or parts of the market where others have grown and we haven't participated. Those would probably be the areas that we haven't participated in. We haven't talked a lot about the distribution side of the business. How does the investment effort get integrated with client service, client acquisition, client retention? We have a few groups here at Wellington. One is called Investment Products and Services Group. They're sort of in between the external part of the business and the investors. So they work really closely with us in terms of product positioning, in terms of product integrity, 
and being a liaison between the investors and the external facing relationship managers and business developers. And there's a lot of coordination. So one of the things we say about Wellington is that our core thing that we do is manage money for clients. And then how that gets into client portfolios and all the different channels. You know, we are very global. We have clients all over the world and almost every channel. And so how that gets there then is we have business functions all over the world. So our business platform began to globalize 10 years before our investment platform. So our business platform was started in about 1996. We started globalizing. And we have 15 offices around the world. So we have local external business people interacting with our clients in those regions to figure out what needs do they have and how can we help solve yeah. those needs. How much time of the research and portfolio team ends up getting allocated to spending time with clients? I think it really depends on how senior you are. So there's three colleagues on the healthcare team that spend the vast majority of time with our healthcare clients. But then many of our clients want to know the team. So when I think back to my career, Back in the 1990s, I used to go to every client meeting or many client meetings with Ed. And that was really important part of my development to really understand that this is real money and clients have real and different needs. And so I really feel strongly that having that early in our emerging investors profile, that they know what the clients want. And we really encourage people on our team anyway to interact with clients as much as possible too. What are the biggest challenges of managing just the operations of a large firm. And you could even compare it today to Wellington 28 years ago. Well, we're obviously larger and much more complex. We're over a trillion dollars. When I started, we were 50 billion. So the complexity of our business is much greater. So I would say some of the things we've done in the last few years is how do we operate as a trillion dollar global asset manager in 2018 that's different than 10 years ago and different from 20 years ago. And so I think we've been very deliberate about that. So how are we structured? We're spending a lot of time about global management. So I think now we have a lot more local managers. So almost every employee in our EMEA and APAC and other offices are managed by someone locally in their office. We think that's going to be critical going forward, how do decisions get made in other regions rather than in the Boston office? That's something we're early in our development of really pushing decision-making out to the regions. So that is something we're spending time on, and we did quite a bit of external research on that. What are the best global companies? One of the things the group who was leading that effort came to the researchers and said, who are your best global companies? What did they find? It's about how you push decisions to local how do you not Americanize someone in China or Japan and you let their local culture come out? So how do you have best practices? And so we're on that journey to figure that out. Where have you seen attention and saying, oh, here's the type of decision that should be made locally versus at HQ in Boston? Probably the tension would be, the most would be talent development, like who should, who should be promoted How should they be compensated? And that's being pushed out much more locally now, and the regions have a lot of input. That would be one. Number two would probably be fees, like how do you do fees in your local region? So we're working on strategies to put some of that decision-making in the regions. So those would be the two that would stand out. But we're going to be on a journey to what are the best practices, what are all the decisions we make? And it's not going to be those two. It's going to be many decisions. And how do we do more of it? in 2022 in London and in Hong Kong and Singapore and Tokyo than we do now in 2018. That's one of our most important things we need to get right in the yes, next 10 years. You just years. touched on it. What does Wellington look like 10 years from now? I think Wellington 10 years from now will be more global. So when you think about where we have market share and where we have opportunity to grow, we have a lot of opportunity still to grow in managing assets both for clients outside the U.S. and investing in asset classes outside the U.S. So EMEA and APAC, our market shares of the markets is lower than it is in the U.S. I would suspect and hope, and and when we think about what is our most important job of the CEO and the line managers and the managing partners, it's to allocate capital to where we think the business is going. And that will be more global, more in the region, more in Asia and in parts of Europe. So that would be number one. I think we will have more alternative skills. 
So if you think about specific skill sets, we will have more investors that have long, short skill sets. And that could be investors we have now that we train and also new skill sets that we bring in. We've been a very dynamic company in terms of bringing people in that have new skill sets. Continuing to look for areas of investing that we're not in. I think we will be in maybe third. We will have more of our assets in privates. So that's an area we have been investing in now for a couple of years. And so there's an effort, like, where is our competitive edge and where could we continue to expand our privates efforts? But that private sort of the, the preponderance, particularly in the U.S., of more and more companies staying private longer and creating kind of a shallower pool for the public markets. Where do you think that goes? Well, I think you're definitely seeing that if you talk to some of our small cap investors, that the companies do not, definitely don't go public in the small cap range as much as they used to in the past. I think it really depends on what the capital market. So right now you have a preponderance of capital available to companies that are available in private. So as long as that continues, then I think you'll continue to see many companies staying private longer. If that dries up, you might see more companies needing to come public. So when I think about healthcare as a microcosm, you know, there was a period of time where the public markets weren't open for a decade, and a lot of companies had to get private capital. And now the public markets are open, and so even though they're getting private capital, they're coming in a much earlier stage in other sectors. So I think it really depends on the markets. And what do you think happens, right? There's so much pressure broadly on active management today. Where do you think that goes over the next five, 10 years? I guess I'm a believer that differentiated investment insights about the world will still matter. But you're going to need to invest in IT, and you're going to need to invest in science to augment that art. And so how do mid-sized companies continue to make those investments? I know they're really important investments for us. So being scale could be more important going forward. Last question before we go to some closing questions. How do you think about asset size. Is it important that you continue to grow from here? It's only important to the extent that we attract, retain talent. So growth for the sake of growth is not critical for us, but growth for the sake of how do we have, we have a lot of new investors that we've hired in Asia. What's their career path and how do we get more assets for them is one example. So like I said, what one of the things that Wellington does, I think that does a really good job of is thinking very strategically about capacity. So we're not asset gatherers. Back to the fact that we believe the only way we're going to serve our clients going forward is if we can produce differential returns, either alpha or a solution to clients. And capacity analysis is very important for that. But hopefully we have a winning model where we continue to attract really good talent in areas that we're not in. And so that will be one area of growth for us. Great. Well, let's turn to some Closing questions. Jean, what is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? One of the things I've started to do in the last decade is learn to ski. So our family goes skiing every weekend in the winter. It's been a great time for us to be together as a family. And I will say that I did not know how to ski <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> and in fact, I've skied with the same instructor for 10 years. I've progressed a lot. But there was a lot of fear. I remember him asking me, what do you do in your day job? He bought me this book called Fear. And I'm like, I don't actually have much fear in my day job. <laughs> but I had a lot of fear. But over the last decade, I've made a lot of progress. Where do you guys ski? Stowe in Vermont. Yeah. What's your biggest investment pet peeve? People are very short term. So it's not a pet peeve in the sense that I can ignore most of that short termism. I mean, that's, I think, one of our competitive advantage that we can elongate our cycle but every once in a while, the short-termism of investment narratives can get under your skin. <laughs> <laughs> what reading do you almost never miss? So I'm very lucky. When I read outside of work, I love to read fiction novels. And I'm lucky that I have friends in publishing. And there's a group of us that share, and I will say I'm the recipient of great books to read over the years. I tend to like fiction novels that also teach you about the world. So they're set in a part of the time or a part of the world where you're learning about the culture, but they're fiction. Is there part of your daily routine of reading? It's not part of my daily routine of reading. It's part of my yearly routine of reading where I might, on vacations in the summer, at points in time when it's more quiet, 
I wish it was more part of my daily reading. Is there something that's in your daily reading that you don't miss? It would be too specific in healthcare to go through all the things that I are must reads for me, but it's certain analysts, certain analysts in certain sell side firms that I would always read. Certain publications like New England Journal of Medicine might be one weekly that you always read to see what's happening. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My parents were Irish immigrants. My mother came when she was a young teenager. My father came when he was 19. And we led a very modest life. I never knew. (laughs) I never knew it was a modest life at the time. So I guess I take away that I grew up in a very loving, caring home. The other thing I would say is that my father never went to school beyond his early teenage years. But he was a lifelong learner. As a teenager, he would be watching PBS and we would be frustrated because we wanted, it was one TV and we wanted to watch. So I would say he read National Geographic religiously for 70 years and he and he watched PBS and he was the best Trivial Pursuit player in our family. So that curiosity and learning about the world, when I think about my father, I think about that. And I think from my mother, she allowed an atmosphere where we could get ahead. And I think we've done better, my siblings and I, than she probably ever expected. But it was reaching further than where they started out. And that, I think, I will always be grateful for my parents. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I'll give you a couple. One would probably be, and I tell this to a lot of young people at Wellington, is to don't sweat the small things that... There were times in my career where I worried about titles. As I said, I started as an administrative assistant. So you can imagine I was probably not paid well for many years. I was ramping at a point in time where I was probably could have earned more money. So I worried about things like offices and titles. And that was probably a lot of negative energy that was unnecessary. In retrospect, I didn't need to worry about that. One of my colleagues, I remember one of the first people I worked with took me out to lunch And I felt like I needed to have my own industry. And he kind of set me straight and said, you are crazy. You're working in healthcare, one of the best industries, with one of the best investors in the world. So again, don't worry about the small stuff. Just worry about learning and growing. Then I think secondly is one of the things we're working on at Wellington is feedback. This is true in life and in true at work, like not letting things stew, like You interact with people. We interact with people all the time. So if something's bothering you, just get it out right away. And that sort of on-the-spot feedback, it just makes life much easier. Jean, it's a great story, both yours and the firm. And thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. 